Hey everyone, welcome to uh, this one hour live show, Learn the Tech, where we will, of course, talk about, as every week, a subject that somebody has chosen. Somebody has sent me an email or something and said, I want you to talk about this. And today I want to talk about objects that we use every day that come from military technology. Now, you know what? There's a lot of stuff that we use that come from military and one of the main reasons is that the military has one of the biggest budgets in the world so of course that means that there's a lot of technology that comes with it so learn the tech show number 23 for october the 4th 2016 is here uh sorry for last week i was unable to attend because of a doctor's appointment and uh so we're going to, it's a kind of a relaxed show today, okay? I didn't want to have a, I had two subjects. I chose this one because it's kind of relaxed. Uh, the other one next week is going to be a little more complex, uh, and I'm saving it for next week. So, and I'll tell you a little later what we're going to talk about next week. So, let's check out our technologies that we have. First one, microwaves. Microwaves. Now, you might think, Oh my God, they wanted to do microwave ovens because they wanted to have some other way of, you know, cooking stuff and uh, they just needed some kind of enclosure and uh, whatever. Well, no, because honestly, between cooking stuff in a, a microwave oven or doing it on a plain stove or something, it ain't that much different. Uh, it is different in taste and in, in texture, but it requires energy. It requires a big bulky thing that will cook. So the microwave oven is not something that comes from the military because they wanted to create something like that and use it. It comes from an accident. We're in 1945 and they are testing new transmitters you know because in the in, in world war ii radio is in really constant evolution and the more it goes the more they're trying to transmit on higher and higher frequencies at the beginning of radio it starts very low very low frequencies why because we don't have what it takes to uh, and all the oscillators that are required to you know uh, give high frequencies higher than very very low uh, you know, a long waves or medium waves or so on. And, you know, we're moving slowly up the scale of radio frequencies as we get more and more uh, electronics, you know, the electronic, the electron tubes and everything. So they get to a point in 1945 where they are able to transmit in the microwave region. Now, everybody knows microwave just because of this object. When you say microwave, Immediately in the head of everybody, this is what they are thinking about. And uh, microwave refers to more specifically a frequency range. And a frequency range that is a little bit below and above 2 gigahertz. So um, at that frequency range, for example, your most cell phones are in the microwave region. Now you might say, hey, I'm going to fry our brains with it. Nope, because they aren't on the proper frequency for that. So it's 1945, they're testing transmitters. Guy is helping out, forgets his lunch on the roof next to the antenna. He goes and help, comes back 20 minutes later after they've transmitted. He noticed that his sandwich is warm. So he's wondering, how come my sandwich is warm to the touch? Uh, and they start thinking about it and they do another experiment because they're not sure, but they have an idea. They're saying, could the radio waves from the antenna be doing something to my sandwich? 
and behold, they try it again, and it's even warmer. So they notice that there's a frequency range that warms up things. And the reason it warms up things is simple. It's because when you approach 2450 megahertz or 2.45 gigahertz, you have a property of physics that exists. The radio wave on 2450 megahertz actually makes your water molecules resonate. And since pretty much everything has water, well, the basically the, the molecules that are moving around are creating some heat. And that is eating a sandwich. And that's what's heating our food. It's the water molecules inside the food that typically uh, you know, move around and heat things. So that's why there are things you can't put in the microwave because there are things that contain very little or no water. And the more water an object will contain, the more heat it will generate. So it's really an, an accident. And basically, the guy that found this uh, two years later had a great idea. He said, Mm, we can we can build microwave ovens and he patents uh, two years later uh, a device that works with radio waves that will heat our food and that becomes the microwave oven and so uh, still today it's used a lot I got one here some people are scared of it um, but, you know, we'll keep that for next week. Next week, we're going to talk about the dangers of our de the technology we use. And is it yes or no, uh, uh, you know, something dangerous or not? So the microwave oven is kind of a military because it's a military base. It's a military stuff. It's just that it's um, military stuff by accident. So as they're transmitting, they notice that radio waves can eat uh, food. Of course, computers. Computers are really uh, very, very important in military technology. Why? Because uh, it starts way, way, way back in the early 50s, uh, even end of the 40s, with something that's called the ENIAC, which is the first, kind of the first uh, what we call a computer. It's basically a huge, huge um, building. And it's basically a big calculator uh, because it's not very powerful compared to what we have today. I mean, just your cell phone today is so powerful compared to that thing. Um, and the reason why the military needs computers is because math is the foundation of pretty much every discovery. We, the universe is mathematical. The universe is math. It is explained in math. And it is kind of the common language, universal common language. And that's how you can actually find out new stuff. For example, that's why we have uh, SETI at Home, the program that can check for extraterrestrial life. It is mathematical. It's math in your computer. It's just being there and checking out uh, possibilities. And um, because of that, the more you're advanced, the more you want to be powerful, the more you want to do things, the more you need powerful machines. So as we start getting into the era of rockets and rockets that go into space, spaceships, satellites, uh, you know, up to the much, much later stuff like cruise missiles that are just guided and that know where they're going because they got maps and memory and so on. Well, the computer is the centerpiece of all of the technology from the military. And the more you've got powerful computers in general, the more you will be dominant, if you can say so, in uh, what you do. And so if we look today at uh, computers, how they, you know, change the world, just look at China, how they're advancing in a, a, a fast pace. It's pretty amazing. And they're now with the most powerful computer in the world. They're super computers, the most powerful and by a, a huge advance with any others 
And you know, that will give him an advantage. That gives everybody an advantage when you've got the top of the line of computers because you'll be able to do the math necessary to create new stuff much more fast, you know, faster than pretty much everybody else. So you'll be the first to discover stuff. You'll be the first to create new stuff because you're the first in computer power. It's very important. And so computers, of course, are a product of mostly the military because they are the one that needed the power first. Of course, after that, the computer goes into different areas. It goes into different uh, areas. It goes into space exploration, uh, stuff like that. You know, I mean, if we look at the power of computers in different objects, for example, uh, I was um, looking at a very interesting, um, um, I think it was on Discovery Channel, uh, where the, um, they were talking about the space shuttle and how the space shuttle had such tiny computers compared to what we have and what we had when they were flying because it was designed in the 70s with what the 70s had as power. So, you know, it's, it's interesting because we use these today. We are all now hooked to our computers. I'm streaming this with my laptop. Uh, of course, the portability of the computer also because the more you have portable stuff like smartphones, the more you can, in the field, do stuff, work around, have all sorts of tools. So, you know, the computer, we're all using a computer. And it's one of those things that uh, pretty much the military brings up. <sighs> this is the jerry can. So for those that know what this is, you might wonder what this is. Where did this come from? Well, this unique little design, you know, I've used this, I remember when I was younger, um, I had to mow the lawn um, where my dad had his, uh, his little shack up north. And we uh, had, of course, a lawnmower that worked on gas. And so, uh, man, we had those uh, jerry cans. And, uh, well, jerry cans are a product of military because the... Jerry can is a unique feature. These are extremely tough containers. They are built in a way that it is more difficult to destroy a jerry can than many other containers in the way they were designed. And so they, of course, were designed to transport by the Germans all the fuel they needed in the 1930s for all the tanks and all the stuff over there. So this is a German invention. It's you'll say, well, what's the technology? Well, it, it's a you know, it's a product of technology. Sorry, you guys, I just uh, have a little sip here. So uh, the, the 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 jerry can is uh, a product of military, and that's uh, funny because you start reading about stuff like that, and you're like, hmm, okay, you know, a, a common object now that you just go to any you know hardware store, and it's like. You got tons of them right there just to buy, you know. Pretty cool. Uh, who hasn't used duct tape? I mean, this is another marvel of the military. And we all have used this at some point or another. Uh, why? Because it's really tough. It doesn't break easily and it's very adhesive and basically this is invented because the military when they're in the field it's tough you know you're brushing against trees and stuff and you're you know constantly if you're especially if you're in a harsh place you know like uh, under fire you have to run you have to jump in the water you can do tons of things what happens your equipment wears and it wears fast and so cracks and holes and all sorts of little things are going to happen here and there so this is invented primarily to patch up everywhere that you need to patch up something it even is used to patch up a jerry can so it's done there for uh just patching up the holes 
and the scratches and the you know anything that can be uh, have a leak or you know could be wet uh, they, they invent this for that and by the way one of the very cool things if you've not seen that episode it's really worth it I think it's on YouTube if you want to have a blast just uh, search for uh, the Midbusters episode where they will build a boat made of duct tape and I mean they're using duct tape only and uh, you'll see the result which is very surprising so uh, Midbusters duct tape check that out it's an amazing episode so this is a tough thing this is really really designed for the military because they need something that's rugged that will uh, you know fix rapidly anything that they need to get fixed because they don't have the time to stop in a, in a shop and have something repaired so uh, duct tape pretty interesting when you think okay cargo pants you know I got I think I got two pairs of those cargo pants with these you know pockets everywhere of course that comes from the military it's some of the stuff that we use every uh, all the time I mean they're still sold in many stores and they're useful they're useful and the military knew that these were useful that's why they invented the cargo pants because they can hold so much stuff so you know like a, a tech guy like me that always has his phone and some other gizmos and technology with him the cargo pants are cool you put your phone you put your extra battery you can put a small uh, mine's are uh, mine's pockets are so big that I can actually put my eight-inch tablet in one of the pockets. So it's like cool, you know. You bring everything with you. So these are made by the military, of course, because you need to bring a lot of stuff with you when you're going around. The more you can carry, the better it is. So cargo pants are interesting uh, bit of technology for that. Ah, uh, the EpiPen. Um, if you are severely allergic to something you probably have one of those why because this is something that can save your life but we're not talking about the product of uh, for 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 people that are allergic the uh epine epinephrine or something like that <laughs> um we are talking about the container that has that product for uh, injection because that thing you know what happened we get into the war and then we start having scary things like uh, you know uh, it starts with mustard gas and stuff like that but then we get into nerve agents of all sorts so the military now is really in danger because things like sarin and vx are so amazingly powerful that just a, a tiny drop of those on your skin and you will die so the army knows that the enemy might have that we need something to you know counteract these poisonous gas but the thing is one of the things you don't want to do is stick one of those long needles like this inside you nobody likes to stick long needles inside you uh, it's not fun just looking at the needle you're still wondering or um, am i going to do this do this or going to die and you're not really sure yet because you have very short time span to do it and it's like mm, okay i die or i put this in my uh, i'm not sure so this actually the container here is invented because it has a unique way of actually having so much pressure that it will still send all the medicine in you without having to stick a needle inside so you don't have to think about man I gotta you know put that needle some people just faint just watching a needle so this is an invention from the military because they're thinking we are gonna have something that every military will have in his stuff in his cargo pants and that we you know they can inject themselves uh, an antidote in case they are in contact with some kind of you know nerve agent so like that our troops will continue to live 
even though they've been in contact. So they invent this thing, which is much easier to use. You just, you know, press and that's it. It is mostly a pressure valve thing. So it injects in a very high pressure through your skin, which of course probably pinches anyway, but it's, you know, you don't have to stick a needle inside you because that is a big, big downer for a lot of people. So that's pretty cool when you think about it. Wow, this, uh, the container using this is um, used. It's, it's invented basically by the military. So if you've got one of those, you can thank the military for preventing you from taking a needle and having to stick a needle somewhere inside of you, which for a lot of people is, you know, even, I don't know, I, if I had a needle to stick inside my, my, my arm, uh, and I have to ask somebody else to do it, I don't think I'll stick a needle myself. So cheers, everyone. And uh, so, you know, thank, uh, thank the, the uh, military for that type of container. Uh, freeze dry is invented by the military. Why? Okay, you're sending troops way out there on the other side of the ocean. You don't know if they'll have anything to eat. You don't know if they'll have something uh, that's not poisonous. You know, maybe the enemy has poisoned food there. Uh, but you need to have nutrition. You need to send the troops out or the military out, sometimes for a long period. But they have to eat and have their vitamins and minerals and everything that they need to keep in shape. You know, if your military isn't in shape because it's not eating, it's not going to find much. So they invent dry freezing. Dry freezing is simple. You remove all the water the, as much as you can from everything that is food. Fruits, vegetables, all meats, everything that you need to bring along to eat. You remove the water and you just freeze it without the water. And why is it important to freeze those without water? Because it changes the texture, first of all. Water expands. It doesn't necessarily make the fruit or the, 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 uh, the meat necessarily beautiful after. And also because if you remove the water, you remove more of the chances that you will have some kind of um, you know mold growing or something like that because there's no water inside and these typically will last for a long time they are kind of more chewable less you know if you ever uh, if you ever buy frozen fruits you notice that these are not dry freezed they are simply frozen. And what happens is dry freeze is if when they're not dry freeze, they're all like slushy and not really cool to look at. These are easy now to bring along in little bags because they don't have any water. They're just uh, basically removed of all the water. And that can, of course, bring along easily. So you have a little plastic bag with your fruits that are dry freeze. And, um, and by the way, two things, dry freeze has two components. The freezing part is not necessarily frozen. Some dry freeze stuff is frozen to keep it better, but some, what we call dry freeze is just basically having removed the water from the, the from the stuff. So you can have, uh, any types of fruits and everybody's seen, you know, dried fruits that you can eat. So uh, they still keep all the nutrition. They still keep, you know, what's needed, but you have a better way of transporting. They also stay um, fresh is not necessarily the word I'm looking for, but they, they keep, you know, uh, they're edible for a longer time because you remove the water and everything. So that's another little side of 
what the army needed. GPS, of course, GPS. And the GPS goes a long way because the GPS started for the military as um, radio signals. The first GPS type um, <clears throat> computer, if you want, all it did was there were ground-based transmitters. They knew the location of the transmitters according to a set code. And they would triangulate. So basically, the military could go somewhere. They would get three, four signals, each with an ID that is different. So their devices, they knew, okay, so we must be here by triangulation of two, three, four more signals. The more signals you had, the more it was precise. And uh, just using a little bit of directional equipment. And it's, it's kind of the first GPS, if you want. Then they moved on to a GPS that used low Earth orbit satellites. Now that was a little better because the uh, satellites would send their position. And if you had a few satellites, uh, your device could, of course, receive that and say, OK, you're here. But the problem with low orbit satellites is that you got to put a ton of them. You got to put a lot of satellites into their orbits in order to make sure that you have a coverage that is 24 hours because low Earth orbit satellites typically take anywhere from like 70 minutes to about 120, 130 minutes to circle the Earth. And they're only in a position around above you that the receiver can get you know, from 15 to 20, 25 minutes at each time. So it means that you got to have a ton of them. That means if you put a lot, it costs a lot of money, but also it will happen where, okay, I don't have any satellites right now. I don't know where I am. So it wasn't super uh, cool, but it was much better than radio signals and the accuracy was improved. Then we had, of course, the GPS system of today. Uh, the Russians have a different system that's uh, uh, Glos Glosnast or something like that, which is a different, they have their GPS basically, uh, that, that shows you how we trust each other on Earth. Uh, they have their GPS system, we have our GPS system. And these use a constellation of uh, geosynchronous satellites. So basically, these satellites are about 22,000 miles up and they are geosynchronous. So that means that the satellite is moving at the same pace that the Earth is rotating, which means that if the satellite's there, it's always there. You always look at the same place, whatever time of day, whatever month of the year, to see that satellite. Now, those are not totally, totally geosynchronous. The GPS satellites are a little lower, so they do move around a little bit, but they're still very high because um, they needed to have a signal that could reach your GPS. So they had to put them in a lower orbit because ge geosynchronous satellite would have been so far away, they would need a lot of power and your device would have need an amazing antenna to receive it. So they put them a little lower, but in such a way that as they do move very slowly, because one satellite will be hours at a time over you instead of 15 minutes, the GPS will receive its signal and, you know, it's a very digital style. So it's sending a signal, a coded digital signal that your GPS receives. It says, okay, you're, you know, geos, you're the, the, the GPS satellite 54, your location is there and it actually checks for how different the uh, time of arrival of the signal to the GPS with its actual exact position. And your GPS with that knows, okay, I must be here because it takes 37 milliseconds for the signal to arrive from that, that satellite to me and 103 from that one to me and 42 milliseconds from that one to me. And of course, you might have noticed your GPS, if you look at the settings in the GPS, often you can see how many satellites you're connected to. And 
the more satellites you got, the more precise your GPS will be. Now, there's a catch here. One of the things that a lot of people don't know is that the GPS, actually, the U.S. Um, military have a major switch for the GPS. Why? Of course, if you go to war, what's the first thing that you're thinking? People can use my GPS system against me. So uh, it's like, okay, what can I do about that? And that's where the GPS system that we have today, although very, accu uh, very accurate, could be degraded. The US military actually tells everybody that at any period of time and for no reason, they could degrade the GPS signal. Now you're saying, yeah, but if they degrade it, they're gonna degrade, degrade it for them. Nope, they've got a separate signal. One that your GPS is not receiving. Your GPS is receiving the consumer signal. The US military has the military signal. And what they degrade is the consumer signal. So that means that your precision, which could be, for example, two meters, about six, seven feet, could suddenly be 400 meters. Now, trying to find an enemy that's around a circle of two meters is not too bad. Trying to find an enemy 400 meters around. It's kind of another thing, you know? So uh, that's one thing that could happen. It never did happen. I, will it ever happen? We don't know. And that's why, of course, there's uh, the European Union, there's uh, the Russians, they all want to have their own GPS constellation because they all want to have control of what's happening. So your GPS is a product of military. Why? Because missiles, drones, everything that the military uses, even their own uh, you know, trucks and their troops, we need to know where we are, where we're going all the time. GPS is a great tool for that, but of course, the consumer version adapted this to let's check our roads and check where we're going. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're amazing little technologies. And uh, a lot of people have GPS in their cars today. Uh, heck, I have one on my bike. So just to give you an idea. So, uh, but, you know, in case of a big war, I would not trust GPS that much. One other little detail, by the way, for GPS usage. Uh, there's a, an article about this, by, by the way, in a radio magazine that I read. Uh, the, um, the solar storms and the geomagnetic field when there's a aurora borealis, it actually uh, will induce errors on or, you know, will basically change the signal of the satellite just enough that your GPS can actually show that you're not exactly in the right spot. So if for some reason someday you turn your GPS on and you're like, what the hell, it's saying that I'm 300 meters away. Maybe there's aurora borealis. Maybe there was a solar, um, some kind of uh, solar flare or, or um, you know, there's uh, just some geomagnetic activity with the Earth because it does degrade and change the signal, by the way. Uh, walkie talkies of all sorts. Uh, you know, these are the new, very new generation today of uh, uh, FRS, GMRS walkie-talkies that work in the 400 megahertz. But for as far away and as long as we can remember of having two-way walkie-talkies, uh, the first were big, giant packs. But today, they are not giant packs. Nobody's calling me. And that person should know that I'm in the live show right now. Um, <laughs> So uh, basically, these are invented by the military because the military needs to communicate. And the best way to communicate is that, okay, at the beginning, it's like tr troops and troops communicate, but you got, you know, it's even better. You want to know which in each individual person, where they could be. Uh, you want to know at least which little troop, you know, if you have a group, a little troop of 10 or 12 or 15, I mean, you might not give them each a walkie-talkie, but you'll have one guy that's assigned with a walkie-talkie or a system of communication. Of course, that brings the walkie-talkie to our lives. So, uh, you know, when I was young, I always remember uh, using 
um, you know, CBs and walkie talkies and all sorts and having a lot of fun with that. And they, hey, I still have, I have FRS or GMR, GMRS radios today uh, that I like. I, I still have big bulky uh, CBs from uh, 40 channel CBs that uh, require like, you know, 10 batteries to work. Uh, so, you know, that's technology that uh, we can use. And every day, you know, if you use one of these little things, uh, these little walkie-talkies, well, you might think that, uh, well, we've got some miniature communications device. And one of the reasons why we've got miniature communications device is simply because the military needed to communicate uh, pretty much. We have the super glue. And this one is interesting because the U.S. military in the 50s is looking for something that they could use that is in a tube and that would be strong enough to fix different types of materials. So they're thinking maybe we can do some kind of a glue that glues metal, plastics, uh, rubber, anything. Maybe there's something we can do with that. So they actually get on something that is pretty much like the super glue we have today. And the idea behind it is, hey, it's cool. We're going to fix everything with that because it's going to be so strong that we're going to be able to fix things in the field and it won't be complicated until they have the glue. And they start noticing that it's not a good idea because it is so strong and it glues to just about everything that it's more of a mess and a problem because not only do they fix what they want, but they notice that if they didn't let it dry correctly, it actually stuck to their bags. To It's just so much of a hassle that they decided the super glue is not a good idea in the army. And of course, the rest of the world knows now that super glue is sold everywhere and the, uh, it, it is a pretty amazing thing. So, you know, this thing sticks to everything. And um, of course, they've devised other types of glues that were more convenient um, and less of a problem uh, because, you know, super glue is, 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 uh, is amazing for what it does, but it's also a problem. You know, I worked at a place where we used a lot of super glue to fix uh, some of the uh, electronic stuff that we did. And I can tell you one thing is if you're not looking correctly into what you're doing, you can actually super glue your finger to something. And I can tell you that removing it from there is... You know, if it's enough of your finger, you might need to go to the doctor to get it off. So uh, because of that, because of the fact that it's just too much of a problem, they decide that super glue is not necessarily a good thing to have in um, those uh, bags to fix stuff. Maybe that, you know, they probably took the super glue and they said, well, let's just use the duct tape. I think it's going to be better with the duct tape. Digital photography. Now, this is a digital camera. We have digital um, digital pictures taken by our phones today. And, uh, well, the military is responsible for this. And, you know, this is amazing because um, what we use in our uh, digital cameras today are really, really amazing devices. The first usable digital um, camera basically that was used was on board a US satellite. It was a US surveillance satellite and it was in 1976. The reason why we want at that time to have digital photography is that sending out satellites that take pictures required, of course, film and film is easily destroyed. Uh, if there's too much space radiation, then the film can actually turn out to be to have nothing on it. Uh, it has many, many uh, problems with, you know, when you send out the satellite in orbit or stuff like that, the pressures and everything that it actually has to encounter made the manipulation of the, the film difficult. But not just that, is that once it was up there, and they took the pictures, 
they had to bring it back down because they had to take the pictures and develop the film. So it was not very convenient, especially for satellite imagery. So they said, we need some way of taking pictures and that it can be stored easily and maybe even transmitted back easily. And that's where we invent uh, the digital camera. And of course, at that time, a digital camera, to give you an idea, is a huge box that is like super cooled because that's the only way that we can use our electronics to uh, have such uh, thing as a digital camera. So basically, the canister that holds the camera and the satellite is like the size of probably 10 digital cameras packed together. And uh, so, as of course the electronics will progress, we get smaller and smaller and smaller cameras with higher, higher, higher resolutions. And uh, so digital photography has the advantage of, uh, you know, requiring very little um, maintenance. It takes the picture, it stores it in a memory cell, basically. Um, and of course, today we have memory cards and USB sticks and stuff like that. It can be transmitted back down without having to send a canister with the film in it that will have to not only come back down, but it will have to re-enter the atmosphere and not burn up. So this is cool because digital means you can send the zeros and the ones in a radio signal back down and we just decode the pictures as we're receiving them. Of course, back then it's not very fast, uh, but it is a great advancement. And of course that reached us. Uh, you know, if I think about my first digital camera, um, I would say it's in 19, well, when did I buy my first digital camera? About 2000, I'd say 2001 or 2002. It was dreadfully expensive had very low resolution and but I wanted one I remember I wanted one it was like wow this is so cool a digital camera this is cool and of course price went down and today we have them everywhere I mean uh, you've got a digital camera in your smartphone today it's not very complex we all have these things now so uh, you know that's another advancement of uh, military because the first Digital cameras are invented to take surveillance pictures of what's happening on the ground. And so this is another way. And, you know, you don't have to handle all the films and stuff. You have a lot less to carry, uh, even in the fields. You know, if you had to take pictures and stuff, digital cameras were so much better. So uh, pretty cool for that. The internet, the famous internet that you're using right now to watch this stream. I mean, this is a product of the military. Why? The military uh, needs a communication system. They, we are, uh, you know, we had that show. We are in 1969. There's that fear of nuclear war. And what comes with nuclear war? We know that uh, communications need to stay functional so they of course create a web of connections why it's called the World Wide web is because if you look at the interconnections between each computer it looks like a spider's web basically and the reason it's done like that is because if an atomic weapon if, it, if they drop a bomb on New York City well that area is wiped out but you can still connect, say, New England to Florida by using another path. So the web, the way it's done, if you're not going from point A to point B direct, you're able to do it in another path. And the Internet is invented in such a way that they think if there's a nuclear strike by the Russians, we still can communicate with parts of the country. And of course, at first it is used only by the military, scientific community, some universities start to have it, and then it progressed, progressed, progressed to what it is today. 
Today you're watching a live show over the internet. Just think about it. I'm sending out, if I look here, 3.5 megabits per second average right now. 3.5 megabits per second. There's 3.5 million little bits that are leaving my laptop. Go through my internet cable here, into my router, modem, into the internet via my internet service provider to all of you around the world. It shows you how advanced the internet is today compared to back then when it was just simple little messages that were sending from one place to the other. Uh, it's almost instantaneous. You know, when I do my live shows and people tell me, oh, there's a 10 second delay from you and me. It's like, wow, 10 seconds. I mean, that's nothing. If you compare that, I'm sending out, you know, a video signal and only 10 seconds after that, you're getting it in the UK. It's, it's nothing. And it could be even faster if you send emails or send things that are less demanding than video. Uh, <clears throat> it could be a second. It could even be less than a second. It all depends on how the pad goes and how much information you got to send. <clears throat> so think about this, <clears throat> how we're using the Internet today to access everything in the world. Uh, you guys know I exist because of the internet. Um, I know you guys exist because of the internet. It makes the world small suddenly. So of course <clears throat> it expanded from a local US uh, internet connection and slowly the interconnectivity as the years gone by were more and more frequent with different countries around the world. Faster computers, again, kind of invent invented by the military. Faster computers meant faster processing of all the different connections and sending out all of the information from point A to point B. So there's a lot of stuff that's interesting in that also. So the internet changed the world. It shapes the world totally. We use Facebook, we use Twitter, we use uh, YouTube, watch videos, watch live shows like this. I mean, the internet is a major game changer in how we communicate around the world. We now know almost instantaneously because of the internet that something is happening. You know, just before I started the show, I had live video. I had a live video from Haiti where the uh, Matthew, the uh, Hurricane Matthew is really, really pounding hard right now. And I had a brief live video and I'm like, wow. I mean, before you would have seen that in the newspaper the next day or two days after. And now you got it almost live. It's like, wow. So the internet, one of the inventions of the US military, it was meant to be kept military usage and uh, scientific community for a long time. But you know, when it, it started expanding, there were so many things that could be done that it slowly expanded into pretty much everything. And now everybody uses the internet. Everybody has access to the internet pretty much. Of course, what do we talk a lot, a lot today about drones? Drones because they're scary. Drones can, um, you know, fly over you, take pictures everywhere, peek into your window when you're naked, stuff like that. Um, I'm sure somewhere, somebody somewhere did that. Uh, you know, there was a news item, a local news item here in Montreal where um, they, um, a school, they actually called all the parents because. A guy was flying his drone over the kids in the schoolyard and everybody got scared and uh, they had to, they, they told the parents that somebody was, you know, and they caught the guy, but the guy wasn't doing anything bad. He was just wanting to, you know, show his drone and fly over the kids and stuff. Nothing dangerous, but, you know, it shows you that uh, these little things can be uh, very, very uh, scary depending on who uses them. Of course, their, uh, Amazon is thinking of using those for delivery. So once again, they'll have what? They'll have, you know, they'll have multiple technologies, a little computer, they'll have a GPS, they'll have the drone itself, which is a flying device. Of course, drones invented by the military. Why? Because how do you go somewhere to take pictures or to maybe send a package or drop something 
and not have one of your military personnel go there, risk getting caught and maybe killed. So in order to think of how we can basically uh, save lives, but still do our military stuff, we invent little devices like this. So the drones uh, in different formats. What do we have? The US military has drones that can actually fire missiles. They have drones, very high altitude drones that can take extremely high resolution pictures of the ground wherever in the world they want. They can use those, like I said, to deliver something. They can use a drone to deliver packages somewhere. They can use a drone to take uh, pictures or movies of an area that they want a little more information about. See maybe the enemy line by flying them very high. You don't hear them, but they're looking at you. So, uh, and you don't have to risk the lives of no one. So, you know, that of course comes eventually because, you know, a lot of these uh, technologies and patents, they, they expire at some point. And many companies that are dealing with the military often have a side of the c consumer side. And they're like, okay, well, we have all this technology about making these types of devices. I don't think we could do some for consumers. They might find it interesting. And of course, consumers use them as they wish, including uh, as I was reading in the newspaper last week, there's a uh, prison here in uh, Montreal uh, where uh, apparently on Fridays it's uh, drone day. Uh, they are sending drones where they send drugs and all sorts of things to the prison. Uh, and so it's, you know, they're used for everything today and of course for a hobby if you like the hobby of, uh, you know, radio controlled toys and everything. Drones are a cool, cool device. You know, that's something that uh, I need. I need one of those drones. Canned food. Canned food. Yeah, that's technology. We, uh, in the military invented canned food because canned food permits one thing that's pretty amazing. It's just conserving the food in a closed environment where no outside bacteria and virus can affect it. And these can stay in there for years and still be good to eat. And of course, the idea behind canned food, once again, we got to give food to these people that will be maybe weeks at a time in an environment somewhere. And this, got, this has to stay, uh, you know, proper to eat. Uh, maybe you're somewhere where there's no fridge, so you can't really use food that will perish easily. You're in countries where it's really hot. But then again, you know, using canned foods will help you. And you can can pretty much everything. You can can, uh, you know, not just fruits and vegetables and sauce and stuff. You can can, uh, you know, all sorts of meat. As long as the container, when it's done, it's done properly and that there's no uh, infiltration of bacteria or anything, these things last for a really, really long time. So canned food, another little thing that uh, is from the military. Now I wonder, they probably invented the can opener because if they had canned food first or invented canned food for that, they probably, you know, just I'm just thinking now, they probably invented the can opener also. So uh, that was our little tour of, uh, you know, there's lots of other things. I mean, um, it, just by thinking, um, all the electronics field, you know, just think of all the electronics, uh, the, the, the fact that the electronics are so advanced today, um, you know, with the chips and uh, with super really powerful processors and everything. All the fields there, they're all driven and they were all driven at some point very heavily because of the military. The military today still spends huge amounts of money on technology. So a lot of the advancements that we get here are in the military. And the military often has uh, technology that, you know, is far more advanced than we have as consumers. Now, the funny thing about what's changing today is how more and more 
of the military stuff uses the same grade technology that consumer have. You know, for a long time, the military had its own set of electronic parts. They were more rugged, uh, they were higher standard and stuff like that. And for certain things, yes, you know, because there's certain areas of the military, you do still need that. But for a lot of the areas of technology that used to have special parts, a lot of the military today is like, mm, you know what, we can save money by just, you know, taking some Intel processors to make this uh, instead of having any special. Sometimes they'll have what's called hardened electronics where they're going to use, for example, a, uh, say, a core i5 processor that Intel makes. But they're going to have it hardened, meaning that they will have special coatings over it that will uh, make it a little tougher for uh, radiation, for example. So, for example, in a, in a spacecraft or in a satellite, you know, surveillance satellites of all sorts, uh, they often have ardent electronics because there's more radiation in there. But more and more, the military is using a lot of the stuff that we just have in our consumer products today. So uh, it's pretty cool. So that was a quick look at, uh, you know, the stuff that we use every day um, that kind of pretty much comes from the military. I hope you enjoyed this look. And I'm sure that you're looking at this and you're thinking of, oh, this and that and this and this. And didn't talk about that. It didn't talk about that. Of course, there are thousands and thousands of different things. But I wanted to show like something that was like the more common, but everybody uses and everybody, uh, you know, uh, basically has in his home or most of the time or, or that we, we hear or that people talk about. So this was Learn the Tech Show number 23 for October 4th, 2016. Next week, we have another subject that's chosen by you. And if you have a subject that you want me to talk about, please leave the comments below this video. Uh, I take note of every, every subject that you guys and girls send me and I do a list and, you know, I just go through the list. So like this, I already have like fresh ideas. Next week, it's going to be interesting. Somebody asked me to talk about the dangers of our technology and kind of give the true or the false, try to see what's true and what's false in those claims. For example, microwave ovens, are they dangerous to use? For example, is your cell phone going to give you cancer? Um, different technologies that we use every day and the claims that they are maybe good or bad uh, for us in a way or another. So that's going to be next week, and I think that's going to be quite interesting to know um, what we, uh, the dangers around us, basically. Because you'll see that in your home, there's kind of a lot of danger around you. But uh, we'll try to make it not too scary. So take care, everybody. See you next week. Hope you enjoyed today's show once again. And uh, remember, every Tuesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, we have uh, our live show where we answer the questions. Uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, Learn the Tech, one hour where we talk about a subject. For those that are interested, some of you have, of course, gone there. Uh, Fridays, I've got a radio show where we talk about um, shortwave radio, amateur radio. Uh, this Friday at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, that's 2000 hours UTC, we're going to talk about scanner, police scanner radios and stuff like that. Uh, if you want to join in the fun. And every two weeks on Saturdays, we also have a shortwave radio show where we talk about a subject of shortwave radio. And uh, we also have some uh, shortwave listening hangouts where we tune the radios live, all sorts of little things. And more shows are coming, so uh, hang in there. Uh, I'm coming with uh, at least one or two new shows uh, that are soon to be announced. So take care, everybody. Have fun. Don't forget, patreon.com slash radio and computers. If you can help me in any way with a little bit of money, really, really helps. And, uh, of course, there's my PayPal, my PayPal account where you can send uh, a few pennies 
at my uh, Yahoo email address. Take care all. Have a nice week. See you next week for the live tech shows. Bye.